Good morning, everyone. Would you stand and worship with us together? The first Noel, the angels did say, was to certain for shepherds in fields as they lay. If he
All right. Well, my name is Rob Dent. I'm one of the pastors here. And if you are new, uh, welcome. We're glad you're here. What you just saw was a little bit of uh, yesterday's sort of wrapping and Christmas get-together fellowship and um, for our Fostering Joy event uh, that's going to happen today. So let me give you just an update on some numbers. So um, each of the 10 families is going to get two freezer meals. Um, there were oh, there was about $2,000 in gift cards and cash given. Um, there were over 278 gifts that were given. So that's that means that each kid, each child is going to receive at least 10 gifts. And so, yeah, that's that's huge. So thank you. Thank you so much for all the ways that you guys gave. And so today, later today, um, we're giving a special dinner to those families. And as you saw on the end of that video, those sort of uh, big bags just full of presents, kind of like a Santa bag. We're just going to send home with the families, and they'll get to enjoy those on Christmas morning. So this is, this is going to be a huge blessing to them and has been a huge blessing to us as a church to be involved with this. Um, so thank you. Thank you again for all those that gave. Uh, we have a Christmas Eve service on Christmas Eve, just in case you're wondering, at 5 p.m. Um, as so, so come to that. There are flyers out in the foyer for you to share with friends and family and coworkers and people in the community and, and invite them to come to that. Um, poinsettias, if you would like to order a poinsettia to honor um, someone, then you can do that on the app or there's uh, order forms in the lobby as well. Um, and so those are $10 each plant. And then uh, Lottie Moon, we're still giving to Lottie Moon, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Every cent of that goes to support overseas missions and missionaries. And um, this year, uh, Paul Chitwood, president of the IMB, sent out a letter, and he said that their goal by 2025 is to send 500 more missionaries. And so um, also just a pro tip on that, you can give all year. To that it's not just at Christmas you can be given to that throughout the year um, and if you want to do that you can just write on the blue envelope in the pews Lottie Moon and we'll make sure it goes there or you can go to their website and give directly to that all right it's Christmas I'm excited I hope you're excited um, we're gonna keep singing we're gonna keep singing some songs and we're gonna give um, some offering right now so let's Pray, and we'll take up our offering. God, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus. We thank you that we, we get to celebrate that year after year, week after week here at church. God, we, we ask that we would, we would do that well this morning as we sing to you. Help us lift your name high. Help us lift your name high above all other things in our lives. Help us leave any distractions and just be able to focus on you right now. God, I thank you for, for those in our church who have given to fostering joy, to bless foster families. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing that has already been in our church and that it will be this evening. God, we ask that that you would use those gifts for eternal purposes, not just physical ones. And as we take up our offering now, Lord, we just ask that you would bless those as well. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
you're willing and able, would you stand with us as we continue in worship? Oh, shit. 
Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold Him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the human deity. Pleases man with man to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Thank you, worship team. I'm so grateful for the worship team and all that they do here. Um, I was telling them this morning that we don't often think of how much work and energy and time goes into leading us um, each week in music. It's not just something you stand up and do, right? Um, and, and so we're so grateful for them and grateful for their leadership. So yes, you can, you can do that. And we are coming to the end of the year. I know a lot of you will be traveling next week and may not be with us. Um, so I do just want to say as your pastor for all of our volunteers here, I am just grateful. I am grateful for all that you do. I'm grateful for all that you put in week in and week out in so many ways, how much you bless your church and how much you bless me as your pastor. So thank you for everyone who volunteers in any sort of way, even if you volunteer your opinion every week to me. I still am grateful for you. I want you to know, church, just how grateful we are. This is the time of service where we like to go to the Lord in prayer um, on things that we are praying for as a church um, this week we are praying for our Christmas Eve service coming up. It is a, uh, a very special service each year. We see so many families that we only see when they're traveling in town. We see so many visitors um, that we are praying this week that God would use that service to touch hearts and lives, that salvation would come through it, that we would speak the gospel faithfully and that God would move in us. So be praying with me this week for our Christmas Eve service and for next Sunday, our Christmas service. You are all invited to be here um, for that as well at 9 a.m. Um, as we proclaim the gospel um, each week, especially during that Christmas season, it's a special time to do that. So be praying that God would move in that this week. We are praying for Excuse me, for church family that are traveling. Um, I know many are traveling today. Some are traveling this week. Um, lifting up our church family and those who are on the roads this week. I will stay off of the roads this week uh, just to not have one more person on them. So uh, be praying for those traveling this week. We have mentioned already our Fostering Joy event. Uh, we are praying that God would use that to bless the foster families uh, this afternoon um, and that these children would just have a great Christmas and that God would show out in their lives and that they would see the hope of the gospel through it. I already just was blessed being part of it yesterday. Uh, and I know these kids and these families are just going to be blessed by it. So thank you, church, for being part of that. But continue praying. Right? We, we don't just do events for the sake of doing stuff and pray that God would use this 
um, to strengthen families, to encourage children, and, and to shed uh, spread the gospel in their lives. So we're praying for that and be praying for that this afternoon as well. Um, I was also able to be part of another community giveaway uh, yesterday just for a few minutes. I know there's so many going on. And I, I just, look, I've only been here for a year and I was told before I got here, but I learned daily just how blessed our community is by a community that wraps around one another. And, and so Let's be praying for our community. I am so grateful to see that in Barstow, right? That, that we uh, care for one another and pray that we would continue to as a community and that God would strengthen us as a community this Christmas. I'm praying for that this week as well. Um, Pastor Rob also mentioned that we are still giving to the Lottie Moon offering. And, and we are praying that God would use that offering to support missionaries all around the world and that God would spread the gospel, his kingdom, around the world through our giving. So there's still time to give to Lottie Moon. Um, but we're praying that that wouldn't just be an offering we give. Um, but that that would represent what God is doing both here but also around the world. And be praying for our missionaries this Christmas. Many of them are, are, are away from family. Some may be homesick. Um, be praying for our missionaries and for the opportunities that they will have to spread the gospel in the next few days. Um, I didn't ask permission to do this, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, last week, we um, had the funeral service celebrating the life of Leonard Schreiner, um, a faithful member of our church for many, many years. What most will never see, though, but I'm sharing it with you this morning, one of the last things Leonard did, though, was to prepare his last Lottie Moon check that we received this last week. Church, I pray that that'll be a legacy that I live. <laughs> that even after I have passed away, that I'm still giving, that I'm still blessing my church and blessing the nations. So church, let's take up that mantle too this Christmas. What a cool, encouraging challenge to every one of us. These are just some of the things I'm praying for. I know you have so many others. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord God, we thank you so much. We thank you for the gospel that we celebrate this Christmas. Jesus, we thank you that you came to this earth and became a man so that you might die for us. Lord, may we not forget that this Christmas. And I pray for all of the things that we've mentioned around the holiday season this morning. For those in our church family who might be here with us on Christmas Eve and those in our community who would join us. We pray that that would be a time where we proclaim your gospel, Jesus. That you would use it to change lives. God, we pray for our family members, our church members that are traveling this Christmas. May they have a, have, have a blessed holiday, and Lord, may you keep them safe. Would you be with our foster families that are going to be represented this afternoon? Lord, we pray that you would bless their socks off. We pray that you would uh, just show out in their lives, and that, Lord, allow our church to just be a small part of that today. God, I pray that out of these foster children that are represented, that you would rise up a generation. God, you would rise up a generation of pastors and missionaries and school teachers and business people and mothers and fathers, and that, Lord, you would use them to shape the nations. God, we pray that these families would, would just be encouraged by us today. Lord, we pray for our community we're so grateful for, for this small community and how you've blessed Barstow and that you've made us who we are. But God, I pray that you would do a movement here. That God, you would use the churches and use the believers here to spread your gospel to so many lost around us. Lord, would you strengthen Barstow? Would, you, would your gospel spread here like wildfire? Would you strengthen your churches here? Help us to be bold and faithful and loving. Lord, we pray for our missionaries around the world. We pray for the Lottie Moon offering. Lord, we pray that this year would be the greatest giving in the history of Lottie Moon. 
And that, God, you would use that offering to continue your work that you've already begun. <laughs> Lord, we are, <coughs> we are so grateful for your workers. We are so grateful for your missionaries that you have sent out. We pray that you would raise up more. Lord, begin here in us. Pray that you would raise up more missionaries out of this place today. Lord, use us this week. Help us to speak the gospel. Help us to live the gospel. And Lord, may we be faithful to you. Lord, as we come to your word now, we pray that you would bless it, that you would speak through it, that you would illuminate this text and make it come alive in our lives. And may we never be the same again. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to turn with me this morning to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, we have been going through Genesis 3 through 5, heading into Christmas, which is next Sunday. And if you haven't been with us here, um, the main point of this, why we're doing Genesis 3 through 5 heading into Christmas is, is as I say often here, um, every passage of Scripture screams the name of Jesus. And so we've been seeing that as we head into Christmas today, actually is our last sermon um, of Genesis 3 through 5 before next Sunday we will be in Matthew chapter 1. And, and we will see how this, this text leads right up into it of what we're going to study next week. Now, this is a longer passage. Typically, um, I have you stand with me as we read, but um, thankfully, you'll be thankful we're not doing that this morning uh, because you're going to see how long the passage is. Um, but don't worry, we'll be back to that next week. Um, this morning, what we're going to see is we're going to see some extended genealogies in the text of Scripture. And, and we're reminded that genealogies represent families. A few months ago, my in-laws traveled to the UK across the pond, and they went to several different countries. So they uh, went to England, and then they went to Ireland and Scotland. And my father-in-law was particularly jazzed out about this. He loved it because that's where his ancestors are from. Right? And so he's done all sorts of genealogical studies. He's tracked down his clan. He knows what his tartan looks like and all this stuff, and he's all into it. And just loved it. He brought back some cool souvenirs, so I was happy about that. And it's always interesting, though, as we look into our family history, right? Companies like Ancestry.com and 23andMe have made billions off of this. Because there's something powerful about connecting with our ancestors. There's something powerful about connecting with our family and our relatives because in learning about them, we learn something about ourselves. And as we read our Bibles, we learn that the Bible in many ways are a bunch of different family stories. That's what I love about Scripture. Is it's all these family stories. You read about Abraham's family, and you read about David's family. At Christmas, we read about Jesus' family. And several sections of the Bible are these huge genealogies that you and I typically skip over, if we're going to be honest. <laughs> but church, it's helpful for us to remember that these are histories. And even more important when we remember that these are our history, church. Over the last few weeks, we've studied the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. And today we finish um, this section of scripture with the same reminder that Adam and Eve, uh, they sinned in the garden. And that history is our history as well. Today's text, we're going to learn this main point. That sin and death spread to all humanity, but God offers life. Like most of the last few weeks, today's story is a story of both hope and hopelessness. But we begin really with a question. The question is this. Is there hope in Cain's family? Now, where we pick up in our text today, if you haven't been with us, we need to know why we're asking this question. Last week, we studied that Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel, and we saw tragically Cain killed his brother. And so God punished him. He exiled him out. But God also put a mark on him to protect him, we said. 
And so there's a little bit of hope at the end, right? That, that God's going to protect this guy. And that's where we pick up in Genesis 4, verse 17, if you're with us. It says this. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. So back in chapter 4, verse 1, right after Adam and Eve had sinned, uh, God gave them hope in the birth of a child, if you'll remember that with us last week. And he's doing that again, right? There's this hope in the fact that a child's been born. So see the first hopeful figure of our text. His name is Enoch. He's Cain's son. And it brings us hope in a couple of ways. First, it shows us that God kept his promise, right? That Cain thought he was going to get killed immediately when he left, but God kept him alive. Cain's still alive, so there's hope. But second, there's still hope because he's able to continue the job of humanity to be fruitful and multiply. From Genesis 1.28, there's this promise, and God says, you, that's your role. And it shows us God is keeping humanity alive, Not all is lost for Cain and for humanity here. And church, you need to remember what we've been waiting for. Genesis 3.15, God had promised that there was going to be a child born who was going to crush the head of the serpent, right? And so every child that's born from Genesis 3 till now, and we're keeping it, we're saying, is this the child? Maybe there's a little bit of hope. Maybe Cain's child is going to be that child, But the next verses reveal actually a growing problem. Although there is hope, the next verses show Cain's hopeless, ungodly family. I want you to see that with me. Begin. uh, Keep reading in verse eighteen. To Enoch was born Erad, and Erad fathered Mahujael, and Mahujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. These are great names to name your kids. And Lamech took two wives. The name of one was Adah, the name of the other, Zillah. Adah bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal-Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal-Cain was Naama. So stop there for a minute. Uh, you're, You're saying, Steve, you said this was hopeless, but it doesn't seem too hopeless, right? In fact, the text is highlighting family success. Jabel lived in tents. He had livestock. Jubal was a musician. Tubal Cain's a metal worker. Like, like if you're reading this text and if they live today, they got a reality show, right? This family's pretty cool. They got all cool, sorts of cool stuff happening. But church, the text isn't done. It moves on to an ungodly example. Now, if you tell in family stories and you bring up this ungodly example, it kind of represents the family. Check this guy, guy out, Lamech, verse 23. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. This is not the kind of guy you want to invite to your Christmas party, right? See how ungodly this guy is? First, he's a murderer. He says, I I, I killed a guy for hitting me. Now, you might be saying, well, the Old Testament, Steve, there's this law, right, um, that you can have revenge if somebody does something to you, Exodus 21. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Those last two words, wound and stripe, are the same words he uses here. The Old Testament has this law. That if someone injures you, you can reciprocate it. Now, that's not an American law, so be careful. But the law never says, church, understand this, the law never says someone can be murdered for injuring someone. Lamech kills a guy for a small injury. Church, this isn't justice, it's murder. Not only that, check out what he does, he brags about it. He's putting it in front of his wives like, don't cross me. Church, it's one thing to sin. It's another thing to be proud of your sin. So why do, did they put this in this line? I think it's for a point, church. I think the example here is showing us that Cain's family is not very hopeful at all. Cain killed his brother and Lamech has taken up the family business. It's a hopeless, ungodly 
line. And, and I believe there's a, a small point for us before we move on here. Church, don't judge the health of your family by earthly success. Cain's family is pretty successful in the world. It reminds me actually of the story of Augustine from church history. Augustine's mom, Monica, was a Christian. Um, she dreamed, had these dreams that her son would come to Christ, and she prayed for, for him to come to know Christ. And, and Augustine was a pretty smart dude. He, he was pretty successful. He was sent off to study at a young age with the best philosophers in the world. He became this famous teacher. He's very successful in life. He was even popular with the ladies, you read in his story. But he lived a wild life of sin. And he did this well into his 30s. And, but you read in his, in his story that early in his 30s, he came to faith. And it, and it changed his life. He had been successful, but he realized that spiritually he had been dead. I love how he wrote it in his confessions. It says this, for, for you, he's talking to God, had converted me to yourself so that I would seek neither wife nor ambition in this world. For I would stand on that rule of faith where so many years before you had showed me to her, talking about his mom dreaming and praying about this. You see, church, Augustine's mom knew that her family's health was, was less about the success in this world, but more about spiritual success. She prayed for her son. Church, the point is here. The Cain's family is extremely gifted. They're on top of the world. But at the same time, we read in their family history that, that the curse of death and sin continued in their family. Church, earthly success is not an indicator of spiritual health. And I know there's, there's preachers all over TV telling you, right, that God's plan for your life is to be financially comfortable, but they're lying to you. Those things aren't bad in and of themselves, but church, understand success and wealth can distract us from what really matters, spiritual health. That's why Jesus tells his disciples after he kicks away a rich guy once, right? Matthew 19, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Church, riches and success aren't true markers of health for you and your family. And so the question is, is, is that how you're judging how your family's doing? Are you judging it all by, by just how successful your parents? Is that all we're teaching our kids? Live for comfort. Live for riches. And your family may just be just as healthy as Cain's, and you may miss out on the riches of his kingdom. We see how hopeless this is. Sin has spread to all of Cain's family, but, but the next verses show us a turning point, church. Check this out. Oh, this is good. The story turns from Cain's family back to Adam's family. There's hope for Adam's family. So verse 25, check it out. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So God blesses Adam and Eve with another child. And so we see the second hopeful figure of our text. His name is Seth. You see what Eve says when he's born? God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for, God, for Cain killed him. Eve thinks this is as if God is pressing the reset button. He's given us another chance. And that name Seth sounds like the Hebrew word for appointed. Eve believes God has set aside another child for her. There's hope here. But there's something else that shows hope in these verses. Check it out. What did they do in response? It says, at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. They began to pray, church. In the Old Testament, there's several names for God in the Hebrew. There's Elohim, which is used in Genesis 1 to speak of God's majesty and power as our creator. There's the, the name Adonai that's used for Lord and Master throughout the Old Testament. Then there's the name Yahweh. 
which refers to God as a covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God who can be trusted above all things. And I, I bet you can guess which one's used here in Genesis 4, 26. Yahweh, the, co- the God who promised to rescue them from Satan through the birth of a child, has sent Seth. Once again, Eve thinks this is him. This is the great covenant-keeping God. And people begin to call out to him, church. It's interesting, this is the first time in Scripture that prayer is mentioned, I believe. What are they doing here? I believe they're doing a couple of things in prayer. First, I I believe they're praising God. They're lifting their voices up to heaven and thanking Him in worship, church. Prayer is worship. But second, I think they're begging God. I think they're saying, God, please fulfill your promise. Make this child the chosen one. There's hope, church, in in Adam's family. So see the contrast between this and Cain's lineage? Lamech killed a guy and then bragged on his own name, but Cain's uh, or Seth's family is calling on a different name, the name of God. There's a contrast here. There's a quick application for us before we move on. That although we shouldn't judge the health of our family by earthly success, church, you can judge the health of your family by your prayer life. Oftentimes in life, our our, our strength and success is not defined by how strong you are, right? But by how strong the people you surround yourself are. Right? There's certain things, if you're dead on the side of the road, you're going to need reliable people. On the other hand, there are people that you wouldn't call for certain things, right? Look, if you need help with a fifth grade math project... Or you need a friend to watch Wheel of Fortune with you, I'm your guy. You can call on me. I'll be there in a heartbeat. If you need help with your car, you better not call Pastor Steve, all right? I'm just letting you know, don't call me. Somebody's dead in front of my house the other day, and I'm just sitting there like, I'm sorry. I'm going to eat my burrito, and I can call somebody if you need me to. I, I can't do anything. Seth's family is strong, church, because of who they called on. They called on the name of God. They prayed to God and it gave them hope. And so before we move on, I just want to ask that question. What about your family? Are you calling on the name of the Lord together? Or is the only time you pray together before meals, church? Are we praying together? In marriage counseling, sometimes the biggest advice I give is, have you prayed with your spouse recently? Kids, have you ever seen your parents pray? Grandkids, if your parents ever pulled you aside, your grandparents and said, let's pray together. That's how you can see the strength in a family. Do you pray together? Do you call on the name of the Lord together? This, the prayers of Seth's family mark a turning point in a hopeless story. And I can guarantee it would mark a turning point in the life of your family as well. And it sets up the story for a possible solution. All right, here we go, church. Y'all getting excited? Y'all aren't yet. All right, wake up. Sets hopeful, godly family. Now, this is the long part of the text. This is the genealogy. Get ready for this. But check it out. Just the first two verses, then we'll carry on. This is the book of the generations of Adam. where When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. He blessed them, named them man when they were created. It's like we're going back to the beginning, right? There's that reset button again. And so, verse 3 through 27, we see the lineage. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness. After his image, and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years, had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years, had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahalalil. Kenan lived after he fathered Mahalalil 840 years. He had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. When Mahalalil had lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. 
Mahalalil lived after he fathered Jared 830 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Mahalalil were 895 years, and he died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years, had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years. He had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years. He had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. There we go, church. That's great. <laughs> Now, now, some folks like to study these genealogies by looking up every person and seeing where they go throughout Scripture. Uh, you can be thankful we're not doing that this morning. Uh, there's another approach you can take to genealogies, though. And it's a two-step process. First, you notice the pattern, right? These follow a pattern. Did y'all see the pattern? Here it is. When blank had lived blank years, he fathered blank. Blank lived after he followed blank, blank years. He had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of blank were blank years, and he died. That's the, that is the pattern we see over and over again. Life, children, death. That's the pattern. Now that's step one. You notice the pattern. Step two is notice when there is a break in the pattern. Is there anything that stands out? That often shows us that something is important. So, so the question for us in this genealogy is, is there anyone who breaks the pattern? Well, yes, there is. Verses 21 through 24. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch lived, walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years, had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. <laughs> Enoch breaks the pattern, right? And this shows us, church, that he's different. He, he, this is a different Enoch than Cain's son. Remember, they weren't creative when naming kids, uh, says a guy named Steve. But, uh, so you'll see some repeated names. Um, but it tells us something important about him. In fact, I believe this is telling us that he is a godly example. A couple of ways we know. First, it says he walked with God two times. It goes out of its way to tell us that. Church, this is the same phrase that will be used of Noah in Genesis 6, verse 9, when God chooses him to rescue him from judgment. Later, later in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, God requires this of all of his followers. See what he says? He has told you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Walking with God. Malachi chapter 2, verse 6 says this of Levi the priest. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. You see, church, this phrase, walking with God in the Old Testament, refers to godly living. Now, does it mean that they're perfect? No. If you think Noah's perfect, check out what he does after the flood when he gets drunk and naked with his family. That's not a good thing. This doesn't mean they're perfect, church, but it does mean that they are living for God. They are a godly example. But the second thing that shows us Enoch's godliness is verse 24, where it says, He was not, for God took him. That's wild, isn't it? <laughs> he never died a physical death. God simply allowed him to join him in heaven. I've heard it put like this. This isn't in the Bible, but it's kind of cute. It's as if God and Enoch were walking together for so long and so closely that one day God looks at Enoch. He says, hey, we're closer to my home than yours. Why don't you just go to home with me? I like that. That's kind of cute. Church, once again, though, I don't think this means he's perfect. So you might be saying, how did he escape death? Well, Hebrews 11 tells us how he escaped death. Check it out. By faith. Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So how, how did he escape death? By faith. 
Not because he's perfect, church, but because he had faith in God. And scripture tells us God shows mercy on who he wants to show mercy. So God took him. And so we might be asking, what's the point of this interruption in the genealogy? I think it's to show us that this family is not like Cain's family. Seth's family is a family of prayer and a family of godly living. And you notice also it doesn't include the worldly exploits like it did in Cain's family. Because I believe this family was not defined by this world. They're living for something else. And so another application, church, for our families. You can judge the health of your family by your faith. Seth's faith marked, Seth's family was marked by Enoch's faith. Right, Christmas time is one of our favorite times to sit around and tell family stories, right? That's my favorite thing to hear family Christmas stories from growing up. Almost every one of them ends in the hospital with me or cousin in the front yard breaking an arm or something. But I, I, I love these stories. They're always funny and they're fun to remember. But church in the last few years has, has I've lost some, some loved ones in my family. I'll tell you what's become my favorite stories, my favorite memories, are my grandpa reading the Christmas story to us every Christmas morning. Because for me, that represents and reminds me of the faith that that man passed on to his family. And church, I believe that's one way you can judge the health of your family. Parents and grandparents, will our children uh, remember us, not just for the weird quirks and the family fun, funny family sayings, or will they remember your faith? Eh, Seth's family did. I can imagine how cool that was, sitting at their family holidays. Hey, remember that time Uncle Enoch was walking with God, then poof, he was gone? <laughs> because of his faith. Parents, grandparents, let's live our lives so that that will be our legacy. There's hope in the godly line of Seth. So we, we return to that first question. Is there hope in Cain's family? Well, not really. But we still get an answer, don't we? Cain's family offers no hope, but there is hope in Seth's family. Check out the end of the genealogy in verses 28 through 32. When Lamech had lived 182 years, now that's not the same Lamech as earlier, remember, no creativity here, um, he fathered a son, and he called his name Noah, saying, out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years. He had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So church, we see one final hopeful figure here. His name is Noah. You see what his father declares when he was born? Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. When man sinned, God cursed the ground. And he doubled down on that curse after Cain sinned. But Noah's dad believed that this child is going to bring relief. Church, the text is trying to tell us that Noah's life is going to be different. And we don't have the time to go through Genesis 6 through 9. Go home and read that today and see how Noah's life was different. But little did his dad know that he's going to bring more relief than a glass of lemonade after a hard day's work, wasn't he? He brought relief to all of humanity. But church, as we finish this text, we see two major families, right? We see the lineage of Cain, and then we see the lineage of Seth. And I believe they represent two major themes that I want us to focus on just, just towards the end of our sermon today. Two themes in tension here. They seem to go against one another. In Cain's family, we have learned that all humans have sinned. Sin entered the world through Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. But we saw last week, it didn't stop with them, right? It spread to their children. And today we see it spread to their children as well, that, that sin continues to spread. Church, this passage is teaching us that sin is spreading to all of humanity. We need to see that. 
As Paul says in Romans 5, 12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All, everyone, everybody, everybody, all of us have sinned, church. And this is where you and I come into this text, right? That you and I are sinners. We inherited our sin from our first father, Adam. And sin leads to death. Lamech is there to remind us that, right? So I ask you this morning, is your life marked by the death of sin? As you read Cain's family, is that the story of you? Is that the story of your family? The text gives us a couple of ways that we can see if that's your life, right? First, is your life defined by worldly success? Is all you care about your own comfort and your own safety? Are you constantly fighting with your spouse about finances? Because that's your savior. Has your jealousy of friends and others and the stuff they have caused you to break relationships? And this, this is where it gets hard. Can, can you not be happy at work because all you think about is the better job with better pay? Can you not be happy at home because all you think about is the bigger house with more stuff? All of these, I think, church, are marks that we are too focused on this world. In church, I, I've worked in church for for number of years now and several different churches and this plagues churches too we can become so focused on worldly appearances and success and comfort as churches that we neglect the call of the gospel to take risks for Christ see it all the time. Church, I, I, I get it. We're in hard financial times. I get it. The economy is bad. I'm paying for gas too. I promise. Church, our own comfort and our own security is not what we're supposed to be focused on here. Rather, God's gospel and God's glory should be our highest value. Church, I'm calling us. Let's go all out for God's glory next year. But there's a second way you can see if you're living for sin and death, and it's this. Is your life marked by pride? Lamech was just bragging about his sin. And I've just been hit with it in my own life too much lately that, that so many in our own world and so many even in the church are just way too comfortable talking about our sin. It's just, it's just too easy for us. Most of you know a couple of years ago I had a battle with cancer and, and if you've ever gone through chemotherapy or you've seen somebody go through it, it messes with you, right? It messes with every part of you, your mind, your, 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 your relationships, your spiritual well-being, your physical well-being. In, in church, this, to this day, it was so difficult for me that I can't talk about cancer without a certain sickness coming up in my stomach now. I hate it so much. It's not an easy thing for me to talk about. And church, I can't help but to think that that's the way you and I should think about our sin. It shouldn't just be an easy thing for us to talk about, church. Sin leads to death. It kills. Christian, we, we should be sickened by the thought of our sin. But maybe you're here and you're thinking, Steve, that's me. I've... I've been living for the world. I'm okay with my sin. Stay with me just for a minute. Because there's one other theme in the text that can and will change everything. And it's this theme. That God has promised salvation. We see that in the lineage of Seth. When Adam and Eve sinned, God sent a curse. But he also gave a promise in Genesis 3.15. That there would be a child who would crush the head of Satan. 
And so God gives Eve a child, but you and I learned last week that he too was a sinner. He's not the promised one. Then Cain has a child, and we learn that they too are sinners today. And here in our text, we see that Eve has another child. Why? Because it's showing us, church, that God hasn't given up on sinners. He hasn't forgotten his promise. And so, church, as we go through Scripture and we get to these genealogies, that's the point, right? We read all these genealogies. You have Seth's, you have Noah's, you have Abraham's later, you have Israel's in the book of, book of Exodus, you have Ruth's, you have David's, you have the Israelites after they get back from exile, Church, all of these genealogies are in Scripture, and church, they're all headed somewhere. They're headed to Luke chapter 3. And so if you have a Bible, turn with me. Luke chapter 3. Oh, church, this is the zizzle-zazzle of the text. You don't want to miss it. Luke chapter 3. This is the final full genealogy in all of Scripture. It's the genealogy of Jesus. And I want you to notice something at the end of the genealogy, and you're going to see why this was so cool that we studied this. It says this, beginning in verse 23 of Luke chapter 3. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, I love that part, of Joseph, okay, the son of Heli, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, the son of Matathias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Esli, the son of Nagai, the son of Maath, the son of Matathias, the son of Samian, the son of Josek, the son of Jodah, the son of Jonan, the son of Resa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kosim, the son of Elmadam, the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of Eleazar, the son of Joram, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Eliakim, the son of Melia, the son of Minna, the son of Matata, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Selah, the son of Nashon, the son of Amminadab, the son of Admin, the son of Arni, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Sarag, the son of Reu, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalil, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Oh, church, you see those underlined names at the end? You should have recognized them, right? We read those in the text today. And church, it shows us the point that thousands of years later from Seth's family comes the birth of another, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Church, it it, it says God's smiling when we read this and saying, I told you so. I told you I would send this one. He's coming. Oh, church, the point of Genesis 4, 17 through 5, 32 is, yes, humankind is full of sin, but God did not forget his promise. And it goes all the way to Luke chapter 3. Church, Scripture's so good. Don't you you see why we study Genesis 3 through 5 heading into Christmas? Because without Genesis, you don't get to see the incredible power of Luke chapter 3. Church, don't skip the genealogies. Praise God for the genealogies. God has kept his promise. Church, that's the hope that you and I have. Because, church, although this is the final genealogy of Scripture, there's something that comes after it. That this one who was born lived a perfect life. Then he died on a cross for you. He did what Cain's lineage or Seth's family couldn't do. And check this out. It gets even better, church. There's more. His genealogy isn't finished. 1 John chapter 1, verse 12 tells us this, that humanity is full of sin, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. (laughs) The beauty of the gospel, church, is that Jesus doesn't just come to forgive you from your sin. He came to invite you into a better family. 
Galatians chapter 4. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Christians, Christ's salvation brings you into a better family. Oh, man. My church growing up used to sing at the end of service that old song, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. And that song means so much more when you get this. Oh, he has brought you into his family. So I asked this morning this last question. Is your life marked by the life of Christ? Do you pray as Seth's family did? Do you walk with God like Enoch? You see, these are all marks of being in his family. And being in his family brings eternal life. Christian, will others say of you one day, he or she walked with God? Sin and death spread to all humanity, but God offers life. We had two funerals this last week. I have another one this next week. And as we perform funerals, as I've done so often, I'm reminded that these two themes are true in every one of us, right? Death and life. Maybe you're here and you realize you don't have life today. And you're asking, how can I receive that life? Seth's family showed us, call on the name of the Lord. Call on him today and you will receive him. Call on him today, he will hear, he will receive you, and you will receive eternal life. If you don't have Christ today, I encourage you, call on him. Make this Christmas a Christmas where you're brought into a better family. Would you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you so much that you have offered entrance into a better family. Lord, as we remember our own families and the goods and the bads and the times that were hard, we're reminded of the great hope that you give in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, this Christmas, as we spend time with one another, may we above all live for that gospel that you've given us. It's in your name that I pray, Jesus. Amen. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest without you. Thank you.
That was going to bug me if I didn't pick it up. Sorry. (laughs) Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in God's peace.